at this time. So if they'll follow the young ladies back to their area. Let's take our Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Turn there in your Bibles. There's a Bible nearby if you need one. And they'll be up on the screen. The text will be, stand as we honor God, respectfully reading His Word together. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. I want to speak to you on this question to try to answer it thoroughly today. What is real repentance? What is real repentance? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read Paul's words written from the Holy Spirit's inspiration from verses 8 through 11. 8 through 11, if you'll follow along with me as I read that aloud. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought or worked in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege to be back in church today and having celebrated the wonderful day of Thanksgiving here in America. I pray, Lord, we'll all be thankful Christians and show that in our lives every day. Now bless, Lord, this message as we deal with this important subject of repentance. Lord, may we understand it so that we and others that we love and know and reaching out to will truly know they've repented. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. The word repentance is one of those biblical terms that has either fallen out of use completely or lost its meaning to so many people. Sadly, there's even church-going Christians in our country, I'm sure, and other places that really don't know what repentance is because the concept, the, the doctrine of repentance is rarely preached and often neglected in church pulpits today. The purpose of this message is to get to the bottom of what biblical repentance really is. So that all of us here, as well as those who may be listening by way of our Facebook Live recordings, will examine themselves and others around them to make sure that we've all really repented of our sins. Now we have to understand right up front that just like there are false converts that are produced by false methods of conversion... There are false components to salvation that will end with the same result. Now, from the point of view of a sinner, remember in salvation there's God's part and man's part. Today I'm going to be stressing just man's part. And from man's point of view, our response to the gospel is twofold. The Bible says we are to believe on Jesus Christ, but first we are to repent And so the Bible teaches clearly that our requirement, if you will, in receiving the gift of eternal life through Christ is repentance and faith. Paul said it this way in Acts 20 and verse 20 and 21. He said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, here it is, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' first message is recorded in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 15. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You see that order? Same as Paul's. Repent and then believe. Now, In looking at these two parts that are essential for sinners to be saved, repentance and faith, we have to understand that in both cases, with repentance and faith, 
they have to be genuine. If you don't have genuine repentance or you don't have genuine faith, you will not have genuine salvation. Now, for instance, let me start by talking a bit about faith. We know the Bible teaches you have to have faith to be saved. But does any faith save? No. James makes it very clear in chapter 2 of his little epistle that faith without works is dead. James says it this way, if you're listening, you want to follow, it's in James 2.14 and onward. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works." So just like James taught that there was a dead faith that did not produce real salvation, so it is when it comes to this subject of repentance that we're talking about today, one has to have genuine repentance. There is a true repentance and there is a false repentance. That's exactly the lesson that we learn from our text back in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. As Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, The key verse really is verse 10. For he says to this church, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. In other words, that's the result of godly, true repentance. But then the false repentance, he says, but the sorrow, not to be repented, that means you don't change your mind about it, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So the key is, he says there's a true repentance that leads to salvation and thus eternal life, but there is a false repentance that leads only to death. And in this case, the death he's speaking of is eternal damnation. We have an example of that. If you want to turn there, I'll read it for you. In the man Esau, in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer again, I believe, is Paul. And listen to the example he gives of this man Esau, who had a worldly false repentance, and it did not save him at all. He says here in Hebrews 12, 16, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Look, he's going to use Esau as an example. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. True repentance. In other words, he did not come to a true repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He didn't understand what true repentance really was. So, at the outset of the message, let me just say this. Can there be anything more serious today for me to talk about? When Paul has just told us that if you don't have genuine repentance, you don't have genuine salvation. Now, the key word in verse number 10 is this word, he uses it twice in this verse. He says, for godly sorrow worketh, or false repentance worketh. One works life, one works death. What we have to do to come to the meaning of true repentance today is to discover what each of these works. Works means produces. You know, you and I go to work, we go to work to what? To produce things. (laughs) <laughs> well, we produce a paycheck, salary every week or two weeks, so that we could take care of our basic needs of life. We're working to produce something. Paul says, true and false repentance, they work something in your life. That word rot in verse 11. Notice he says, For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. He uses that word rot. It's the same word for worked or worketh the same word. So what he's saying is that true repentance will work itself out or show itself in certain responses. Now before I get into those responses that he gives in verse 11, let me give a little disclaimer here right up front in case someone is wondering about this. Do you and I repent just on our own? 
Do we repent because it's just all in our own heart, it's all in our own conviction, it's all in ourselves to repent? No. No one would repent unless the Lord first convicted us to repent by His Spirit. This is God drawing us to Christ. He has to draw us away from our sins. That's what repentance will be, a turning away from to bring us to Christ. One of the beautiful verses about repentance that I always love to go back to is Romans 2 and verse 4, where at the end of the verse, Paul says this. He says, not knowing, he says, I wonder if you knew this. Make sure you know this. He said, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Wow. Now, God doesn't repent for you. He doesn't repent for me either. But he leads us. He moves on our hearts. So as I'm talking about repentance today, please don't forget that this is God's work in you and me. He wants sinners to repent. Now, we ultimately have the responsibility to repent. That's true. But God's going to work on us. Now, back in verse 11 of our text, I want you to see all the many statements that Paul makes about how this church at Corinth had repented. He's going to commend them, really. In fact, at the end of the verse, he says this, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What matter? The repentance matter. He ends the verse by saying, you did it. He's commending them. He says, you, you did. But let me, let me go through with you what they did. He uses every kind of terminology here to explain what they really did. First of all, he said they sorrowed after a godly sort. Verse 11. What does this mean? It means that before you and I ever repent, or while we're in the mood to repent, we're in the conviction to repent, we're going to be sad about it. We're going to sorrow over our sins. You know, nobody repents that doesn't see their sins as wrong. You know why a lot of people never repent? That means they never get saved. They really don't hate their sins that much. They're really not that sad about them. They're really not that upset over them because they really haven't seen them as God sees them. So he says they sorrowed after a godly sort. Then he says, next thing, he says, what carefulness it wrought in you. What does he mean, carefulness? Carefulness has to do with caution. When you're careful, you're cautious. He's meaning that as you repent, you're careful about your sins. You're, you're searching yourself. You're finding out your sins. You're examining your life. You're doing some personal reflection over your sins. What carefulness. Then he says, what clearing of yourselves. Wow, what does he mean by what clearing of yourself? It means... You're coming to terms with your sins. It means you're seeing them how God sees them. You're not trying to, to justify your sins. You're not trying to rationalize your sins. Do you know a lot of people do that? That's, I think, what Esau's problem was when we studied Esau. Esau knew he was wrong for what he had done, selling his birthright. But he wasn't really sad to God about the birthright. He was, he was sad the way the whole thing worked out. He didn't really have personal conviction about what he was doing wrong. He just didn't like the consequences of what he was doing that was wrong. See, if you're going to repent, you've got to really come to terms. You've got to admit your sins. You've got to be open about them. You can't blame others for them. That's clearing yourselves. Then he says, in the next phrase, see what indignation. Wow, you know what indignation is. It's an old word that means hatred of, to, to have remorse over. This is back to the same idea I, I mentioned, but here it's even deeper. You've got to hate your sins. You really do. You'll never repent. I never would have repented in my life some 37 plus years ago when I came to Christ if I would have seen my sins as the evil, wicked, monstrous things they really were. See, too many people play games with sins. They really love their sins. That's why, you know, in a heart, or in a nutshell, in one sentence, I could explain to you why most people, and I'm not going to say all, I'm not God, but I'm going to tell you biblically why most people never come to Christ. Here it is. They love their sins. They love their sins. They love to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, as much as they want to do it. And when God comes and convicts them of it and tells them, hey, you can't have heaven in your sins too. They choose their sins. And they die lost. The great writer Harry Ironside wrote a great book called Unless You Repent. Here's what he said about how people think about their sins and it's why they don't get saved. He says, low thoughts of sin come from low thoughts of God's holiness and righteousness. 
Sin seen in the light of what he is will fill the soul with indignation and horror. Nor will it be indignation against some particular person, but against the sin itself and against ourselves that we should ever have thought lightly of it, of sin. Well, going back to the verse, the next statement is a vehement fear. He says, and see what vehement uh, 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 fear that you have, or what fear? He calls it fear. What does he mean by fear? Well, he's talking about fear regarding the judgment of God on sin. You know, the reason you and I ultimately will repent if we, if we do, if we ever will, is because we ultimately see that we, we're under the judgment of God. We're, we're in fear of His wrath. We come to believe that God, who is holy, is angry at our sins and will not continue to let us get away with our sins. Then he talks about this phrase, vehement desire and zeal. What's he mean? Vehement means passionately. If you have vehemence, it means you have zeal. You have the, kind of the words go together. The vehement zeal, the next word, same thing. You are passionate about your desire to get rid of your sins. There's such a burden. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? Oh, I know I go back to it a lot. I love the old allegory by John Bunyan. When Pilgrim had that weight of sin, it was, it was pictured in the, in the drawings of the book, uh, of the allegory, as a big weight, a big sack full of rocks or whatever on his shoulders. And he walks like this all the time until he finally gets to the, the cross. And in his repentant state, he turns to Christ and the rocks of the boulders around his shoulders that weighed so heavily upon him just fell off and rolled down the hill. That's this vehement zeal and desire. Now, when this church at Corinth had experienced that, only after they had experienced such a thorough examination and experienced a thorough activity of repentance in them, would Paul then say in a separate statement, I read it already, in all things, what things? These things I just talked to you about, what real repentance is. Ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Oh, I love that phrase, approve yourselves. He means you've come to an approval position. What does he mean? By God approving of your repentance, by others seeing your repentance and approving of it. But I think mostly, and this is a beautiful teaching, that you will come to approve of yourself. You'll be able to forgive yourself. You'll be able to ex come to an, under an understanding and an acceptance that God has forgiven you. This is how important true repentance is, friends. If you haven't really repented, you'll never come to understand how your guilt and all the wicked things you've done can totally be removed. God wants to give us an approval, a right standing with Him. So just like genuine faith is shown by evidences, according to James, good works, so genuine repentance will be shown by genuine products or fruits of repentance. Remember when Jesus said, you shall know a man by his what? Fruits. Matthew 7, verse 20. Well, those fruits have to do with what genuine repentance looks like and what genuine faith looks like. Now, it, it's back to that principle that I think is so amazing. That is that just like none of us, when, when I was first saved 37 plus years ago, I couldn't have got up before you like this and explained all the ins and outs of repentance and faith and justification and redemption and regeneration and, and the sealing of the Spirit and all of the things that happen when a person is converted, when a person becomes a true Christian. I couldn't have explained all that. And we can't ever in our lives put in words all that happens. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can experience the effects of salvation. Jesus said it this way, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And now here's the sound there, but can't not tell us, tell us where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't see the wind. You can't, you can't uh, touch it, so to speak, but you can see its effects. And so he says, so is everyone that is born again of the Spirit of God. The great A.W. Tozer said it this way, Offer, God offers life, but not an improved old life. The life He offers is a life out of death. It stands always on the far side of the cross. Whoever should or would possess it must pass under the rod. He must repudiate himself and concur in God's just sentence against him. 
What does this mean to the individual? The condemned man who could find life in Jesus Christ? How can this theology be translated into life? Simply, he must repent and believe. He must forsake his sins and then go on to forsake himself. Let him cover nothing, defend nothing, excuse nothing. Let him not seek to make terms with God, but let him bow his head before the stroke of God's stern displeasure and acknowledge himself worthy of death. Having done this, let him gaze with simple trust upon the risen Savior, and from him will come life and rebirth and cleansing and power. The cross that ended the earthly life of Jesus now puts an end to the sinner, and the power that raised Christ from the dead now raises him to a new life along with Christ. Well, beautiful words. And so, the best way to know if you and I have repented is to look at our lives and say, is there fruit, is there a product of real repentance in our lives? Back to what Jesus said, you shall know man by his fruits. Now, before getting into that, what I want to do with the rest of the message is to give you two questions that will be pertinent for this examination of what is real repentance. We're going to say what it is, what is real repentance, and then what it looks like. What it is and what it looks like. Now, the what it is is going to be a short part of the message. The what it looks like will be the longer part, and it'll be up on your screen in a moment. But let me just start with a couple of quick thoughts that you have to get before I could even go any further. Because I said, repentance is so misunderstood. It's neglected. It's it's not preached about and taught very much today, but it's all throughout the Bible. First truth you have to understand is that repentance is essential to salvation. I've been saying that, but I want to make sure you get that. There is no salvation without real repentance. Jesus said in Luke 13 and verse 5, I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Paul on Mars Hill, in the great statement on Mars Hill, says to those Greeks that he was preaching to, For the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He overlooked. He overlooks us in our sins. He has grace and doesn't kill us and condemn us right on the spot. The times of this ignorance, God winked at. But but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Do you know all of the Bible's great preachers preached the message of repentance? It's not new for us today. It's not new with the New Testament. It's not just in the Old Testament. Every preacher of God, Old and New Testament, called people to repentance. Isaiah 1, verses 16 through 18. Listen to Isaiah's words. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You know what all he's saying there? People say, well, is that works? You mean you're saying you do those things to be saved? No, those are evidence of, of repentance. Those things are what you will produce when you have repented. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see the order there? Very important order. Before he says you can come to me and we'll reason about salvation and I'll save you. First he says you better get those things right in your life. Stop doing those things you're doing. Repent of those things. Remember the story of Jonah? I love little Jonah's book. Uh, you remember that he was called to go to Nineveh? And as he went to Nineveh, we, we're told that he is to preach to the king and all the people of this wicked city of Nineveh, that's the capital of Assyria, that they better repent. Remember how the story went? It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. They believed Jonah's words when he said, you better repent or in 40 days God's going to destroy your city. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and he covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? In other words, God will change what he was going to do. He'll not change his mind, but change the direction by which he deals with us and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And I love verse 10. Here's this pagan Gentile city. 
ruled by an ungodly king. And they came under such conviction in Jonah's preaching. They didn't repent. And listen to what God did. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Wow. I already told you the first message that Jesus preached was repentance and believing the gospel. But I think this is important too. In Mark 6 and verse 12, as Jesus sends out the apostles on their first missionary journey. First time they ever would go out on their own, two by two, into Israel. Just a limited mission trip, yes. But I want you to hear what their message was. Here it is in Mark 6 and 12. And they went out, the two by two apostles, and preached that men should repent. That's what they preached. Now one other point before we get into the heart of the message. Not only is repentance essential to salvation, repentance is more than turning from your unbelief to your belief. This was a false, mongrelized definition of repentance that even independent Baptists began to teach years ago where they didn't teach you how to really deal with your sins. They just taught when you stopped your unbelief about Christ and started believing on Christ, that was how you changed your mind, and that was repentance. That is garbage. That is not true. That is not what true repentance is. Of course, true repentance will lead you to believe on Christ. We'll talk about that in the further points. But repentance is a genuine, heartfelt turning away from your sins of the past, to with a desire to live a new life for Christ. That's real repentance. It's not just getting a change of mind from unbelief to belief. It's about dealing with your sins and being willing to turn to Jesus Christ. I know my own testimony well, and I've told you it many times, but it bears repeating that I wasn't saved just because I started believing Jesus was, was the Son of God. I already knew that. I was raised even in a system that taught that. It was, that wasn't a new thing for me. I knew Jesus was the Son of God. I knew He was born of the Virgin Mary. I knew He rose after three days. That was all taught to me in this religious system I was raised in. That wasn't new. I'll tell you what was new I had to deal with, though. My sins. That wicked, vile, ungodly, perverted, selfish, rebellious life I was living. That's what I had to deal with. And when I repented, then I turned to that Jesus Christ with all those great attributes and truths about Him. But sin has to be dealt with. A pastor once asked his class he was teaching what was meant by the word repentance. And someone spoke up immediately and said, it is being sorry for your sins. And the pastor said, yes, indeed, but sorry enough to quit them. (laughs) I like that. Sorry enough to quit them. And he was very, very right. Now, For the rest of the message, I want to get into the fruits of repentance. And who better to go talk to and read about and listen to on the subject of the fruits of repentance than the man who coined that phrase in Scripture. The man who spoke the most about repentance in the New Testament, the great man, John the Baptist. Let's go back to Luke chapter 3. and We'll pick out some things from this section of Scripture and end our message on this. If there's anybody who knew what the fruits of repentance were, it was John the Baptist. That's what he spoke about. And this is what repentance really looks like. It's essential. It's more than just unbelief to belief. Now we're going to talk about what it will look like in your life and in my life. And remember, the key to the message today, we've got to examine our hearts. Have I really repented? Have you really repented? Have your loved ones and friends and people you care about, who may, many of them may say they're Christians, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Here's the question, have they really repented? Listen to John the Baptist, and we're going to start in chapter 3 and just read through this first section of this chapter. It starts like this, let me just lead into it. Verse 1, chapter 3 of Luke, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Idurea, and of the region of Traconitus, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Very apologetic, very historical, very specific, the date and time and who was in control of the world. Here comes John out of nowhere. Remember John. He was in the wilderness for the last 
15, 20 years since he was a boy, since he was a teenager probably. He's 30 years old now. He comes out of the wilderness wearing camel skins, his hair's all over the place, his beard's everywhere. He's a Nazarite. He never cuts his hair or beard. He eats honey and wild locusts. He has camel skins is all he has to wear. But man, he was a powerful preacher. And his message is going to be that men must repent. And so we want to give you some six truths that John brings out in his preaching about what is real repentance. Number one, from this text we're going to see, real repentance reflects on personal sin. Real repentance reflects on personal sin. Look at verse 3. It says, And he, John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for, or to lead to. For means to lead to. Baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, repentance leads to salvation and the baptism is a picture of that. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now we know John is quoting from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 40, verses uh, four, uh, three, through, 3 through 5 actually. And as he is quoting Isaiah, I want you to see what he says. Because this leads right to the point I'm making. When you repent, you will think about your sins. You will reflect on your own sinful ways. So Isaiah, who's being quoted by John the Baptist, says the first thing you've got to do is you've got to make the crooked paths straight. You've got to make his paths straight. What does that mean? That means you and I are described as living a crooked life. You know what a crooked person is? Yeah, a crooked person, we, we call a person a crook. We got that from the way of people living a crooked life all over the place. They're not straight, they're not solid, they're not, they're not dedicated to one thing. They're, they're, they're thieves, they're all kinds of different things. Here, you're to make his path straight. Then he says, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked, there's the word crooked, shall be made straight. And the rough way shall be made smooth. What is he getting at? Isaiah is quoting all this stuff about topography, about a hill being brought down, a valley being brought up. It's all symbolic language to an agricultural people who lived outside all the time and they knew how the terrain of the land looked. It's about getting your life right. It's about dealing with your sins. You've been living all over the place, up and down and all around. He says, you've got to make your life right. You've got to deal with your sins. You've got to reflect on how your sins are and what they've done to you. That means you've got to start seeing your sins by God's divine standard, the law. John and all these preachers that preach repentance, they preach the law. They started telling people, this is what God says you're to do and not do. And you and I are to examine our lives like the people in John's day had to examine their lives. And they had to say, man... I'm sure, I'm sure falling short of that mark. I sure haven't lived up to that standard. See, repentance only comes when you see how your life is falling so short of what God wants, what God demands. He is the God of the universe. These are His laws. You are citizens of His universe. He has the right to command us, and He has a right to punish us when we break His commandments. Well... When you and I see our lives in light of His divine standard, then we're ready to come to Him. Verse 6 is the last quote from Isaiah 40, verse 5, and it says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's the end of the quote. In other words, you can't even see what salvation's about. You can't see what it even looks like. You can't get around it. You can't be exposed to it. You can't embrace it until you first deal with with your sins, the crooked ways, the valleys and hills and all the things you've done away from God. So the first thing of what real repentance is, it reflects on personal sin. But number two, going on in John's message here, in his words, it recognizes divine wrath. It recognizes divine wrath. Go to verse 7, but go to the end of the verse. I'm going to split that verse in two and deal with the first part of it in a minute. But the end of verse 7, he says to these people that come, and we'll talk about them in a minute, O oh, generation of vipers, snakes, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wow, the wrath to come? Yeah, that's God's wrath. Is there a wrath to come? There is. 
There's a wrath for every person who lives on planet earth if they don't repent, if they don't come to Christ and are saved. They will come under the divine, holy judgment of this great almighty God. Oh, we were reading in our study of Revelation here recently of the great white throne judgment. You ought to read it just to remind yourself of this horrible time. It's in Revelation 20, verses 11 to the end of the chapter. And all the dead, great, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And all the people who stand there are judged according to their works that are written in the books. And the wrath of God cast them out of His sight. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Look at verse 9. It basically says that same thing in John's own words. John says in verse 9, And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, see evidence, there's got to be some products, is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's why he said that. See, true repentance will recognize God's divine wrath. This is where the idea of the fear of God is essential to the gospel message. I remind you again, as I have said many times, but it bears repeating, that when those angels in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7 are preaching the everlasting gospel, I love that title. Man, that is just grips my heart to hear. Everlasting. It didn't say they were just preaching the gospel. It says they're preaching the everlasting gospel. If that's the everlasting gospel, that means it's never changed. It's always been the same. You know what the first words out of the mouth of those angels will be? Fear God. Fear God. True repentance always recognizes this divine holy being that we are all accountable to. We're under His authority. We must submit to what He says. Again, A.W. Tozer wrote, The poor quality of Christian faith and the uncertainties that mark the lives of a host of church members grow out of our modern evangelistic scenes, absence of real repentance. So too, the absence of repentance is the result of an inadequate view of sin and sinfulness. No fears, no grace, said the great Bunyan, John Bunyan. Though there is not always grace where there is fear of hell, yet to be sure there is no grace where there is no fear of God. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and they that lack the beginning have neither middle nor end. (laughs) The old John Bunyan Bunyan quoted by A.W. Tozer. Let me go on to number three so we can finish this. So, real repentance recognizes divine wrath. It first reflects on personal sin. But number three, I like this one as you see in our text from Luke 3. Real repentance rejects religious ritual. It rejects religious ritual. Now, go back to verse 7. I told you I was going to pick up the beginning of this verse. Here it is. Verse 7, chapter 3 of Luke, he says in the beginning of the verse, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. And then we got the words, O generation of vipers. Now, Luke doesn't include something that we've got to pick up from another gospel writer. So turn back to Matthew 3. Because I want you to hear who he was really saying this to. Thank God we have four Gospels that give us a complete picture. If one writer leaves out a little detail, you'll pick it up in another writer. Well, Matthew tells us exactly who he said these words to. O vipers, generation of vipers. Here it is. Look at Matthew 3, 7. This is Matthew's account of John the Baptist preaching. And here's what it says in Matthew 3, 7. But when he, the he is John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, there's the words now, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So this adds some insight into something I want you to see that's so important. Do you know what true repentance will make you denounce It'll make you reject. It'll make you totally abandon any of your religious, ceremonial, sacramental ways of thinking you'll be right with God. 
I was brought up in a system that taught us that if we just simply went through these different sacraments and, and uh, uh, kept the little things that the priest said we should do and we did this and that, then maybe we'd get close enough to God that He might let us into heaven. If not, we could just go to purgatory a while and later on God might let us in. That's what I was taught. But I'll tell you, when you come to reflect on what true repentance means and what it'll lead you to, you'll abandon all that nonsense. You'll see. That's why John said when those Pharisees and, and Sadducees were coming to him, what, what, why did he say what he did? Because they, they were mocking his baptism. They were saying, hey, no big deal. We'll just go ahead and do this baptism thing. We're used to things at the temple. We do very much like this. They had what was called mikvahs, which were washings. The priest would go down in a pool of water. It wasn't true baptism. It was a mockery of it. And they say, hey, we do that back at the temple. No big deal. We'll just go and see what this John guy's all about. We'll go ahead and do that baptism thing. So what? We'll get wet. John wouldn't do it. He wouldn't baptize them. He said, you vipers. You snakes! I will not baptize you, he said. Show forth meat fit for repentance. Show me some fruit that you really repented or I will not baptize you, he said. Do you know in 1 Thessalonians 1, there's a precious verse about salvation, and it really explains this ritual thing beautifully. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. He says of them, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye, you the church at Thessalonica, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Wow. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Those divine, sweet, precious saints at Thessalonica, Paul commended. He said, you know why? I know you're truly one of God's. You turned away from that idolatry. And all that idolatry was was a bunch of religious rigmarole. It was a bunch of do's and don'ts. Do this and do that. Uh, take this and take that. Eat that, don't eat that. Come here and do this on this day. That's what I, I was raised with. Doing all these things. But I'll tell you, when you come to see your sins before a holy God and see what He demands, you'll throw all that out. There's no way that'll change your life. No way those little rituals will ever have any impact on me or you. You'll reject religious ritual completely. Well, let me move on back to Luke 3 because here's another great thing He says to them. Real repentance will renounce family ancestry. It'll renounce family ancestry. When John says in verse 8, go to verse 8, back to Luke 3, 8. Here's what John said, same thing in Matthew, says exact same words. Bring therefore, bring forth therefore fruits worthy or meat fit for repentance. And then listen to what he says. This is a really an interesting statement. He says, and begin not to say within yourselves. Well, the reason he says don't say it, because they were thinking this. They were saying this. We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You know what true repentance will lead you to do? Let's put up number four on there if you would, guys. Renounce family ancestry. It'll, you, you'll renounce it. You won't be able to depend on who you are nationally or ethnically, who your family... That won't matter. See, John exposed them. He said... Don't give us this, we're, we're Abraham's children. They were trusting in that. These were Jewish people who said, you know, we're Abraham's children. They said it to Jesus later. Our father Abraham did this. Our father Abraham did that. He said, you know what? God could raise up children of Abraham out of these stones if he wanted just people to be children of Abraham. He said, no, that won't work. See, true repentance means you won't cling to anything from your past tradition, family ancestry, what a great example is our dear friend, Brother Phil Savalowski. He's been in our church many times and preached here. He's a converted Jew. I like to call him completed Jews. You know his testimony if you've been here to hear him and read his testimony in, in written form. He's put it out in written form. When he was 16 years old, here was a Jew that was raised in a home going to synagogue and, and keeping Shabbat every Friday night and so forth and the Seder on the Passover and all that. And... At high school, he was reached through playing football at high school. He, his girlfriend, who he was dating at that time, you know, guy trying to please his girlfriend, uh, asked him to come to a, a Christian concert or a Christian some kind of gathering. He had never been to a Christian anything <laughs> at all. 
But he went to this Christian gathering, and a guy got up and preached. He began to hear about Jesus the Messiah. I mean, that was taboo for a Jewish young kid like him. But he really got interested in it. And he began to study, and he, he got a Bible, began to read it. And he finally came to his parents one day and told them that he was deciding to give his life to Christ and become a Christian. You know what they did? They kicked him out of his house. 16 years old. He had to go live with other relatives and friends that helped him through the rest of his high school and until he was able to get on his own. He never saw his father again in his entire life. And his mother only one time later in his life. Totally act like he was dead and gone. But you know what? He doesn't say it with, with a chip on his shoulder, a bad attitude when he tells you about that story. You know what he tells you? Hey, I had to renounce that past. I had to renounce that that Talmud, Talmudic and, and uh, uh, Sabbath-keeping stuff from my background. I, I couldn't hold on to that ancestry. Even though all my family was Jewish, I needed to follow Christ. That was his repentance. Part of his repentance was leaving his past. That's why I had to leave my past. Man, my family, man, they were mad. My grandmother was a staunch Roman Catholic all her life, took us to Mass all the time. I went to parochial schools for several years. When I told her I came to Christ, I was down here in Texas. I was almost 20 years old. I told her uh, she thought I was going to go to the Catholic Church and go to Mass all the time when I came down here at 18 years old. I didn't want anything to do with God or anything else. But when I told her I became a Christian, she said, well, where do you go to church now? I said, I go to a Baptist church. She goes, what? What's a Baptist church? You're supposed to be Catholic. I said, I'm not Catholic. I renounce that. She didn't like that. She didn't like it at all. But I had to renounce that. That's what true repentance does. It renounces that which is false. That's why I don't, I don't have much assurance, at least, in my mind, of anybody who stays in a false system who claims to be a true Christian. I've had people ask me, can, can someone be this or that and still be a Christian? I tell them this. What does this and that teach? What does that group teach that this person is in? If it does not teach the true gospel of Christ, of salvation in Christ, I don't, I'm not saying about every little doctrine they might disagree with. I'm saying, do they preach that Christ, coming to Him, He's the only way. Through repentance and faith and God's work on the cross for us, that's the only way to be saved, only way to be right with God. If they don't teach that, then that person who stays in that is not giving evidence that they have truly embraced the gospel, the truth of Christ. They must denounce that. That's what John's telling the Jews here. He said, don't tell me you're sons of Abraham. That won't get you anywhere. You've got to denounce that. Number five, let me move on. True repentance reveals spiritual transformation. It reveals spiritual transformation. Now we're getting to the, the fruits of it that are really going to start to show. When he said in verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance... That's what he says will happen when you truly repent. And how that is played out comes in verse 11. Look with me to verse 11. This is a great portion. This is Luke giving you a longer uh, discussion of this whole preaching of John than anybody else. Mark this, Matthew, John doesn't, but Luke does. And he tells us a little dialogue that happens to people who came and were thinking about repenting. Listen to what he says. The people say in verse 10, let me go back to verse 10. And the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? I think that word then is crucial there. They're saying, if we repent, then what are we going to do then? What, what's our life going to be like? They wanted to kind of do what a lot of people want to do. How's my Christian life going to look? How, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll shoot straight with you. I'm going to tell you what it's going to look like if you really repent. Here's what he said, verse 11. He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. The first group, he says to them, and he doesn't tell us who the group is, but it's basically human nature. What's human nature? Selfishness. We don't want to give and help other people. He says, I'll tell you how you're going to know if you repent. Now on, when somebody needs something, you give it to them. If, they, if, they have, if you have two coats, you give one to somebody who needs one. If you have food, meat means generally food, you give it to someone who doesn't have food. Now, he's not saying that you're saved by giving your coat or giving some food. He is saying that is fruits of real repentance. That's how it looks. Look what he goes on to say to the publicans in the next verse. Then came also publicans to be baptized. There's an important little clue. They really wanted to be baptized to show they'd repented. And they say unto him, Master, which means teacher, what shall we, what, what's our part in this repentance? How's our repentance going to look? 
I love this. And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. See, publicans were tax collectors. They liked to pilfer off the, off the top. These tax collectors, hey, they, they had an easy way to do it. Nobody was going to really hold them accountable. All they had to do was give a certain amount to the Romans. They could tell the poor Jewish people, no, your taxes are this much, and they'd, they'd skim off the top. So he says to these publicans, you really want to be baptized? If you really repented, I'll tell you how you'll know you repented. You only take what you're supposed to take. You quit stealing. Now lastly, this is tremendous. He's going to tell some soldiers, probably Roman soldiers. Can't guarantee it, but it's amazing there's some soldiers here. Listen to what he says to them. Verse 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him. They all asked the same question. What shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. You know what he's teaching here? This is a beautiful thought about real repentance. Real repentance will transform your life. You will begin to show your repentance by now doing right where all you did before is wrong. That's true for information. Do you remember when Saul was stopped on the road to Damascus? You know the great story of Saul's conversion. The first thing out of his mouth when God knocks him off his horse to the ground and a bright light appears as the glory of Christ speaks to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Do you know what the first thing Paul said, or Saul said to, to the Lord? Verse 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That sounds very similar to what I just read to you in Luke 3, exactly the same thing. Saul said, Lord, how am I going to know how to live now? What am I going to do? See, that's real repentance. I remember when I was first saved, my wife and I, I didn't understand salvation from anything. But I knew this. God didn't want me to continue to live in that wicked life I was living. But I didn't really know all about the good ways I was supposed to live. So you know what I kept doing? This shows I repented. I kept coming to church. I kept reading the Bible. I kept getting with my pastor and saying, a Preacher, Dr. Green, what am I supposed to be doing here? What should I do here? How should I make this decision? What should I do in this situation? See, that shows transformation, true spiritual transformation. That's why there's a verse that's so shocking, but you need to see it. Mark 16 and verse 16. At the end of the Gospel of Mark, there's been a verse that's tripped up a lot of people, I think. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that tough. If you understand the direction we've went with this message, you'll, you'll pick it up, I hope, easily. But listen to what he says in Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be saved. Now that verse has caused all kinds of controversy over the ages. It shouldn't because people say, wait a minute, I thought we didn't have to get baptized to be saved. You don't have to get baptized to be saved. That's true. So why does that verse say that? Because God is saying what he's saying in these other passages. If you claim to be saved and will not follow the Lord in a new transformed life, like following the Lord in that first step of obedience, which is baptism, you've not been saved. That's exactly what it means. He that believeth and follows the Lord in baptism will be one who shows from their heart. See, just like James said, faith isn't real if you don't have works with it. You're not showing it's real. You will not show real repentance without spiritual transformation. Last point, we're done. True repentance receives the true Messiah. Real repentance receives the true Messiah. I love verse 15 through 18 in this discussion of John. Because it, John's not done. He just told the people about how to show that there was real spiritual transformation by changing your life. But then in verse 15, he says this, And as the people were in expectations... Or expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John. Boy, don't take that lightly. You know what John does? I don't know if it happened the same day he said the earlier words. It could have been another day. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But John perceived something that you and I sometimes miss. And I pray I won't miss it because we need to see it. John saw these people were really thinking over their repentance. They were, they were musing about what they heard from John. Wow, what about this? How am I going to... 
And, and you need to let people go through that. I've witnessed to people. I've, I've talked to them and, and told them about how to be saved. And I've talked to them about repentance. And I said, now, are you willing to repent? Let's go through your life. You don't have to tell me all your sins. You've got to have to tell God. I said, are you willing to stop doing that? Are you willing to stop doing that? And you know what? Then I don't, I don't go any further with it. I said, think about that. You do some struggle over that. I want you to think through that because that's what John did it said they were musing in their hearts here of John not of John who John is it's what John was teaching them and here's what they were musing as well this is great whether he were the Christ or not he had such a influence on his generation that they thought he was the Messiah the Christ John answered, and that's what he answers them in verse 16, saying unto them all I indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat unto his garner. That's the barn, but the chaff he will burn with, uh, with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Do you know what he was how he finalized this whole thought of real repentance. This is part of his message. Truly people who repent will turn to Jesus Christ. That's how you really know you've repented. See, you're not saved by just getting rid of some sins and bad things in your life. That's just one side of two coins. That's a side of a two-coined salvation. The one side's repentance. The other side's faith. You turn to Christ. You turn away from your sinful life. You turn to Christ. Now, do you do it alone? Do you do it in your own power, your own strength? No. I told you, God's working. His Spirit is working. It's the Spirit that draws when He convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But I'll tell you, you know when you've truly repented because when you have, you will turn to Christ Jesus as the only hope for your soul. You'll be like that drowning man out in the lake who he knows he's drowning and he has no hope until he sees Christ. He's like that lifeguard on the shore. And when he sees Christ, she sees Christ, they yell, Save me! Save me, Lord! And the Lord saves that sinner. I end with Paul's tremendous words in his testimony of Acts 26 as he's preaching this gospel to Agrippa, this, this wicked king, really. He said to Agrippa, he's trying to tell Agrippa, why would I give my life up that I once had and go through all I've went through and now be arrested and eventually give his life for the faith? He says, where on, O King Agrippa? I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, God's vision on the road to Damascus, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles. And here's what his message was to all these people. I love this. This is Paul summing up all his ministry to, the, to this very day when he's preaching to Agrippa. That they should repent and turn to God and do works fit or meet for repentance. I end the message by asking you again, and only you can answer this, no one else. Have you really repented? Do you have those evidences of what true repentance looks like in a person's life? And how about your family, your friends? I think sometimes in our zeal to want to think our closest loved ones are saved, we forget, have they really repented? Because without repentance, there is no true salvation. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We're going to take a time, as we always do, with some music playing softly, for you to think about this idea of repentance. Boy, Paul made it so vital. He said, remember, false repentance leads to death. True repentance leads to life. And so without it, a person cannot go to heaven. A person can never be saved. And so this is not some small kind of light issue to just toss aside easily. This is eternal. And so you and I need to examine our hearts. You know, I can't be your judge. No one else can either. Only God knows your heart. I'm not going to try to say I know your heart. But I've done what John did. 
in his message to the people of Israel that day. I've thrown some things out to you today to make you examine your life. We're going to pray. Maybe there's someone here in this room that, as they've heard about repentance, maybe it's brand new to you. That's okay. That's good. You have to hear about this. This is essential to the message of salvation. And maybe you've never been saved yet. And that's great that you're here. I'm so glad you're here. We don't want to push you. We're not going to try to prod you and, and manipulate you in any way. We're giving you the truth of God, and you've got to act on it. And this repentance is a big part of that. Now, this is part of our response. Remember, God saves through what Jesus did. Now, he puts the ball in our court. Our response is this repentance and faith. Examine your heart. Maybe you've been thinking through your life lately. Maybe you've been seeing your sins lately. Maybe you're under conviction. You feel bad about your sins. You realize there's really never been repentance. Repentance is a decision. It'll show itself in evidences afterward, but it's not something you clean up your life and then you get saved. No. If we had to clean up our lives first, then we'd never be saved. So we're not talking about a progression of good works that you do. It's a decision you make, but that decision will be so heartfelt and from the Lord that your life will change. So all you do is you come and submit to God and say, Lord, I'm giving that up. I'm changing my heart. I'm leaving that sin. And God will answer your prayer. He will give you the strength to go on in a new life. I never thought on May 11th in 1984 when I stood in that little church, smaller than this building we're in right now, I never thought I could ever give up my drugs my immoral living, my filthy language, my rebellious way of life, the rock culture that I was involved in. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have, humanly speaking, ever change myself. The Bible says, can a leper change his spots? I could have never done it. I did know this, though. I was under God's judgment for those things. I knew God wasn't happy, and I said, God, I'm so sorry. That's like a poison I wanted out of my life. Please, God. All I can tell you is, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to give my life to you, Lord, and you have to help me go forward from this point. And when I called on the Lord that night, it was on a Friday night. I'll never forget it as long as I live. God changed me from that point on. I was ready to get rid of the drugs, took all that music and dumped it in the trash can. All that. Because that's what true repentance does. So we're going to have some music play after my prayer. I'm just going to leave it to you. If you have questions, I'm willing to talk with you here. We can go back in our choir room in the back and talk a little while if you need to, maybe later today or this week. Hey, don't put off this repentance thing. This is essential to eternal life. Father God, we pray now at the time of this invitation that every person in this place, and by way of our Facebook page, will be thinking about this idea of what is real repentance. We need not wonder about it. Your word is clear on the subject. But if there's anybody here who's never repented of their sins, may today they come under such a conviction to realize it's been so wrong how they've lived that they're willing to give it up and commit to following Jesus Christ. Bless, Lord, this invitation we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Some music will be playing softly. God is speaking to your heart today. Maybe you have questions.